It started over summer break from college. I saw him on the beach and I had to have him. He was a friend of a friend, so I did what any 90 girls would do. And I called our mutual friend that night and I said I wanted him. I didn't care that he was 17, I was 20. Send him over, I said. He was in my driveway 20 minutes later, like a Domino's pizza, only hotter. <laughs> There were more in my 20s than a 13-year marriage, than an extremely traumatic, prolonged disillusionment of said marriage and our family. As I was reclaiming myself after years of recovering, I thought I was ready to date. Yet, my life was a mess. My kids emotional and awfully poorly behaved and home. My ex around a lot. Never mind a global pandemic and the risk of death. I realized I couldn't date, but I certainly was looking for a diversion, a second chance not to be wasted. With no way to travel and, no, and more than 50% custody, I didn't have a lot of flexibility. But I could see no reason why I couldn't cougar. <laughs> I spent weeks planning. I landed on a lower age range of 27 and an upper age range of 35. 27 because I was 47, and 20 years felt like forever, even if I really preferred guys under 25. <laughs> At 35, they, didn't, they should want to date me, not by, be cougared by me. And if they didn't want to date me, well, that would suck. So that was my upper limit. I knew nothing about dating apps, so I researched and I found that there were actual cougar apps. And I made the decision to set the app up to coincide with my kids and my ex being out of town for three days in August of 2020. My ex can be a bit stalker-like. Out of town seemed a lot safer. I was afraid no one would want me, but I missed the point. The Cougar app exists because older women wanting younger men is way less common than younger men wanting older women. <laughs> These guys were willing to accept that my trauma is how I ended up hooking up with them, as long as I hooked up with them. I set the app up with a single picture, a fake name, India, and the admission that at 20 I had dated a 17-year-old and all these years later I still longed for an 18-year-old because obviously legality is an issue. <laughs> I would feel insecure about being desirable and then remind myself that this was just about sex. How desirable did I need to be? My inbox was saturated immediately because you know, sex. Bounty Hunter was in my driveway eight hours later. I wouldn't let him in. I wouldn't let him in because I watched forensic files. We made out, I a nurse practitioner, throwing COVID concerns right out. He was tall, built, and had gorgeous blue eyes. He asked me when he was allowed in. I had three days, no kids. I told him to check in with me with the next morning, but I was pretty sure he could come in. 24 hours later, he's back. We talked for a long time. He loves to talk. And plus, it's not every day that there's a bounty hunter on your couch. <laughs> he realized that I hadn't slept with someone different in 16 years, and he considered that he might not want the job. But sex. I told him <laughs> to give me my sexy back. He took my hand. He was encouraging and tender and driven. Afterwards, I said, can we do it again? because the wonder and the awe in my body and brain needed some reinforcement. Of course, he said, repeat. I felt so incredibly grateful for him because in that moment, he was what I needed. Contrasted to the alarm bells that went off as soon as I was within striking distance of my ex, Bounty Hunter, who I knew nothing of, didn't scare me in the least. This realization of the fear I had been living under was startling, somewhat jaw-dropping. Getting my sexy back was simple. Bounty Hunter and I continued to see each other at least once a week. But once a week was not going to work. I needed more. I added another. Being new to this, I wondered who I was, a liberated woman or a slut, if I started sleeping with two guys at once. So I asked both of them. They both thought that the societal constructs around women and their sexuality were ridiculous. <laughs> Plus, they said, We aren't gonna hold you to monogamy if we're not holding ourselves to it. <laughs> the first two and I still see each other, but I needed more, others, if nothing else, than to combat people's shitty work schedules. <laughs> Bounty hunting. In the first week on the Cougar app, I got a message from a 21-year-old at Pendleton. I was flattered and gracious, but I told him no. There is no way. You are way, way too young. 
He just kept coming back. Why can't we meet, he asked. I asked him why he wasn't pursuing something age appropriate. His responses were the same as the guys on this app the world over. Girls my age are trouble. It's too much work to even get to know them. They aren't comfortable in bed. He wasn't chatty, he never begged, and he never sent a dreaded dick pic. <laughs> but he was consistent, always there, asking to meet me about once a week. I moved forward, added a Bumble profile, entertained actually dating a guy my age, but found them squirrely, content to text, but too shy or COVID to meet. COVID scared to meet. But Bumble allowed me to fill my schedule. I always had somebody I could access. I came up with a set of rules. No sex on the first date, neutral location or event to start. Nakedness might result, but no insertional sex. I was raised Catholic, and I swear, this makes like perfect sense to people who are raised Catholic, I swear. <laughs> Like, if you are over 35, I will not have sex with you until you want to date me. If you're under 31, sure, let's see about the chemistry. <laughs> 31 to 35, this turned out to be a gray area. Best to just avoid it. <laughs> Except for one, 33, because holy shit. <laughs> of all of the good bodies, his is still the best. COVID symptomology and condoms were discussed, and moreover, someone available weekly was what I was looking for. There were no secrets. Everyone knew about everyone else. I lowered my age range for a perfect 25-year-old. He was the first person where I regretted our age gap because he is an incredible human. I definitely could date that one. But this isn't negotiable. My ethics make building a future with someone under mid-30s unfair to them. I checked myself. I found Chef 30 within a mile of my house. Amazing sex, no connection, but proximity and the ability to be in and out of his place in 17 minutes was golden with my schedule. <laughs> the 21-year-old Marine never disappeared. I told him what my real name was. I told him after two months of his weekly check-ins that the least I could do was to agree to meet him. He drove the 45 minutes to my place with no guarantee I'd let him in. But with COVID looming large, no place else really to go. I let him in. <laughs> we shared a few beers and talked about all of it. How I ended up with a broken life and a newfound sexual freedom. How he got out and away from home because home was fraught with trouble. I never felt like he was too young or too stupid or that we had nothing to talk about. Sure, his frontal lobe wasn't fully developed. <laughs> But I saw human potential, not something to be avoided. <laughs> I made the first move. He is the perfect kisser. And I was awestruck with want. I certainly wasn't sexually frustrated anymore. I had several partners. It was him. I led him to the bedroom and reviewed the rules. He checked in to make sure I was consenting to my rules. Because when your adolescence is shaped by the Me Too movement, that is what you do. All the clothes came off. He was so incredibly good at me. I assume at it, but for me, he was perfect. We cuddled in the afterglow, we talked. Turns out his mom is 10 years younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> I giggled. Again, I said, but still no sex because rules. But please repeat. And afterwards, you have to go now, it's getting late. It was 10. I knew I wanted to see him again. I knew I wanted him, I knew. But I didn't say that because at the rate I was dating, a week was like a super long time. I waited until Wednesday to text, please come back Friday, 18.30. Sure, he said. We rehashed our weeks, got naked, consummated, and at this point I had to ask him, how old were you when you started having sex? 15, he's only been at this game for six years. How is this even possible? <laughs> We cuddled and talked, again I said, and so we did, because this is a young guy's superpower. <laughs> I ushered him out, again telling him it was late, 10 p.m. <laughs> I didn't stop with the others, time was passing, and I was actually forming relationships with most of them, and there was no way with the geography and the fact that 21-year-old lived on base at Pendleton that I was seeing him more than once a week, but please, please repeat, Friday nights. After a week of the stress and the mental load of my ex-stalking, work, and
and single parenting, it was Friday night, a predictable escape. The sex got so much better, easy top three of my life. I'd giggle in the afterglow with the wonder and the awe and the impossibility of it all. I couldn't wait for Friday nights. I was careful to remind him, maybe myself, that whatever was happening between us, we weren't building to anything. About eight weeks into seeing each other, I used my name. He was relieved. He hadn't known it. <laughs> the ridiculous of the entire situation was raining down on me, and all I wanted to do was take his clothes off. We never saw each other more than weekly. We started watching forensic files in between sex sessions, bless his heart. And I started to crawl into the safe space that was his body on my couch. It wasn't lost on him that I started hyperventilating every time we started kissing, how my want of him was so encompassing and unmistakable. But he said he'd hang out with me even sex was off the table, which I think was him just trying to let me know that he actually liked me. While I agreed with him, I knew what I had in the sex, the most perfect partner at a time in my life when I could actually fully enjoy it. Yet, there was a dawning realization that the safe space on the couch, what I felt when he hugged me, shouldn't be taken for granted either. It was, after years of feeling unmoored, unsafe in my own home, grounding, I began to crave both the sexual high and the high of feeling held by him. We never texted outside of planning for Friday nights. We ate together once. We left the house together once. I challenged myself on things I would have thought were important. With him, there were no check boxes, no future to worry over, no list of things that he needed to be. I picked him up at the airport after Christmas. He had been gone for two weeks and I needed him, his brand of sex magic sexual perfection, and maybe just him, the quiet way he negotiated life. I drove him up to base after our normal double session at my house. And as my breathing steadied with his hand on my thigh, I became aware that something had shifted. I felt something other than raw sexual desire, something way more confusing and, well, impossible. I ignored it. In January, as he was leaving, I said, I'll see you next Friday night, 18.30. Like, we don't have to text anymore at all, right? Like, this is just what we do? He said, sure. I knew that what was ever was between us was temporary, and for lack of a better word, precious. The sex with 21 got so much more intense, and the afterglow way more confusing. I have intellectual walls a mile high around my heart. I knew our relationship wouldn't, couldn't translate to the real world. I knew all of these things. So I attributed my confusing afterglow to the oxytocin of orgasm, never mind that I didn't find any of my other sex partners' afterglows confusing. Ignore it. In spring, a catastrophe ended with me having my full custody of the kids. It took me about five minutes to realize I was losing my Friday nights, losing 21. Well, and except for Chef in our 17-minute sessions, everyone else too. But Friday nights and losing him stung so much more than the others. I booked a hotel on the ocean my first week of full custody and got a sitter. I texted him to tell him that location changed and that he could spend the night. I explained to him that we were losing Friday nights. Never ruffled, he said we'd find a way. He said it would be fine. That night in the hotel was, for me, a really big step. The vulnerability of sleeping adjacent to him and then waking up with him. Though, in my head, it was such a big thing. In truth, it was almost normal. He came to stay in San Diego for a couple of days of March for work, and he was at my place when I got home one day. We kissed in the kitchen, and I was gobsmacked, standing in the house that it took me until I was 40 to afford with a 21-year-old kid that I could easily have birthed, with the realization that his being there was the most natural thing in the world. He belonged. When he left, I didn't know when I'd see him again or how. There was so much stress, so much worry about the kids, so much scrambling to get them care, full custody, so much. The loss of Friday nights and the knowledge that what I felt for him had crossed a line. As he left, he held me to his chest and told me we'd figure it out. I just kept shaking my head. I saw him twice more, the last time, a Thursday night sneak in in mid-April because he was dating a girl his age, so confusing, <laughs> who he thought he actually liked. I was too scared to ask him why he couldn't have her and keep me on the side. Too scared to know that although I had feelings for him, maybe he didn't have feelings for me. Too insecure to deal with that, even from a freshly 22-year-old. 
We orchestrated the most perfect goodbye sex two people could orchestrate. The intensity, the longing, our eyes dilated and blazing was something that looked an awful lot like love to me, but maybe was just want. We never wanted the session to end because we knew it was the end. His girl or not, he'd leave by summer's end. I started to cry softly as I walked him out. Well, this really, really sucks, he said. I hugged him. A million and one thank yous, I said. There are no words, I said. We kissed one last time. I didn't tell him I loved him. <sighs> but in that moment, I knew in the most honor, honest, vulnerable, pure way I knew how to love, that I loved him in a way I wasn't sure I was capable of. Instead, I watched him leave. I stopped sitting in the deep corner of my couch because I longed for him there. That lasted for months. We talk and text regularly now, and our conversations are often lighthearted. But sometimes, consistently and quietly, we both acknowledge that what we feel is real, even if our 25-year age gap means we can't do anything with those feelings. We're getting matching tattoos, if that counts. <laughs> I know now that the only way I could have ever fallen for him was because he could never be. I would have put the walls up early and high if he could have been. But because we could never be, I allowed myself to feel something that I would never usually allow myself to feel. Losing him still sucks. But I gained so much by allowing him in and then never bothering to put up the walls to prevent the feelings. I am humbled by the space we created. I don't have plans to stop the cougaring, but, <laughs> as I'm up here crying, but part of my healing has been the recognition that I am both a liberated woman and a slut, <laughs> and that my human drive to love is still right there, waiting. Thank you. Lisa Sacco, everyone. Lisa.